podcast. And we are extremely lucky to be here today with Dr. Alan Gavick, who is one of the world's most foremost experts in stem cell therapy. So we are really excited to talk to you. I'm also here with Kevin Peak, the president of Next Health. I'm Dr. Darshan Shah, the CEO and founder of Next Health. And why don't we just launch right into this? Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about your story and where where you started using stem cells and how stem cells came to come into your life. Absolutely. I started, uh, I practiced foot and ankle surgery for 15 years and got very frustrated with the insurance whole schedule, how everything came on insurance. And I started looking outside of that venue. Uh, I have a degree in business, so I knew that I could probably make it happen in business. I got hired by a cardiac device company about 12 years ago to develop their products for actually cardiac device. So there was all already in place and an antibiotic packet that you could put around a pacemaker defibrillator for high risk patients, you know, diabetic patients, on patients on dialysis, that sort of thing, who had a super high risk incidence of infection. So we started, I knew some people in the placental industry who had freeze-dried placenta. We made it into a pouch. It was incredibly successful. Well, this company also dealt with dialysis patients. So then we made a, a patch for arterial venous anastomosis patients. So it went from six months to two years of a healing process down to three months. And that, the placenta tissue. Right. And that oh. graft had, uh, had matured. So the incidence of death goes down significantly. And then we developed for uh, ophthalmology. We developed for wound care. But the whole time we're seeing the research that's going on around the world. We were very limited in the United States, but the research around the world was umbilical cord blood stem cells. So about five and a half, six years ago, when they were allowed in the United States, I got rid of all of the other industries, and we focus completely on just the distribution of the umbilical cord blood stem cell product in the United States, and it has been phenomenal. Got it. So when you say you were using placental tissue, was there a thought in your mind that there must be something in this placental tissue that's causing it to heal quicker versus an, a, a different type of graft? Or is that how the, the stem cell conversation happen with placenta? Yes. So we knew that the the growth factors and the anti-inflammatory components in that placental tissue had value. The problem was the cellular components being an allogeneic product, right? So we could take that and make it so it was an acellular matrix. All it is is a matrix. Well, while those cellular components are not alive, like we see now in umbilical cord blood stem cells, those dead cell walls still put off growth factors and proteins for a period of time. It may be only hours to, you know, maybe several days. But when you have an incident like putting in a pacemaker and you have that small particulate that comes in in the operating room for a person who is like significantly immunocompromised, that's all you really needed. And it, it really saved them and it worked. So we knew that the potential was there just from the the physiology of what a, a really a placenta is about. So even though we freeze dried it, took all the live elements out of it, there were still those growth factor components that were very much alive. Wow. So leading up to this meeting, we decided to do our own stem cell treatment and we both just got 60 million live stem cells put into us. And Personally, I'm buzzing right now. I mean, and I don't know if it just I'm excited because I got stem cells put in me, but I can, you know, I really feel like I can feel it. I mean, I'm, you know, you just, you have a different sensation going on. So what, I mean, I would love to know kind of what's happening right now in this moment, which we'd be expecting. Well, the, the cellular component, I mean, you have trillions of cells in your body at any, any given point in time. And when you choose to put them intravenously in your body, these are cell signaling mechanisms. These cells from this unknown baby born in California, they never become a complement or part of your body, right? They're just giving cell signaling mechanisms. So what happens is they're attracted to cells in your body through paracrine signaling, right? I mean, we could get into the discussion of that, but through paracrine signaling, they recognize cells that are in distress because cells that are in distress give off tumor necrosis factor alpha, interferon gamma, and then the whole level of, of cytokines and interleukins, 1, 2, and 12, and in a chronic inflammatory process, 8. 
So what they do is they start very rapidly to balance those out and start to talk to those cells. The number one thing that mesenchymal stem cells from an allogeneic source, not not ourselves, Mm -hmm. but from a different source of the same species, is modulation of the immune system. And when your immune system starts to balance itself and really bring itself into balance, that's when you start to get that feeling. I've experienced it multiple times over the last five or six years. I've probably done 15 or 20 infusions myself. Wow. And I know that exact feeling. It's, yeah. it's a little euphoria sometimes. Um, clarity of thought. The first time I did it, people had asked me for about a year or so when I was in the business, have you done stem cells? And I go, why would I do stem cells? I'm not sick. And then it was like, it's that moment, right? right? It's that, okay, um, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. <laughs> so when I first did it, um, I didn't really expect anything, but I grew up on a farm in the 70s. So I had pretty bad hearing loss. And the first thing that I noticed was about a month later, I'm standing in my kitchen and I hear a beeping sound and I can't figure out what it's from. I finally located it, it was my coffee pot. I never knew that my coffee pot beeped when the coffee was ready. So strange little things, the aches and pains, of course, you know, go away. I I played, you know, a lot of athletics, but it's, that's not unusual. And people say it all the time, a euphoria, really buzzing, really, really feel energized. Yeah. How long does that feeling last? Um, You know, after the first time, I never really got that buzz, but I still have the energy levels. Right. Uh, My wife and I do CrossFit. So there's a lot of energy there and a lot of damage to your body. Do as I say, not as I do. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Type of thing. But at least unless you can do 15 sessions of stem cells. Exactly. (laughs) Unless you can do 15 sessions of stem cells. I mean, I'm 58. I'll be 59 years old this month. And in CrossFit, most of the people that we work out with are in their 20s and early 30s. So I have greater endurance, quicker recovery. And that's really Really where I see it more than anything, because physiologically, that's what I'm looking for, to be able to stay at, you know, a a relatively healthy level. But I love to work out. And but even now, you know, three hard days of workout, the fourth day, I'm still a little pretty beat up, Mm. you know, but in the beginning, it'd be tough to go into the second day of workout. So it's made me better in, in a lot of different ways, not only physically. Mental clarity is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll start to notice that over the next several days, you'll feel the mental clarity. And all of this stuff is not documented or studies. Most of it's anecdotal, but you'll feel it. Right. And so when you were saying, you were giving kind of the technical definitions of what's happening internally. So I'd just like to break that down a little bit. So just now when we did it, we we had about two ounces, I believe, of stem two cells. Two cc's. Two cc's. I'm sorry. Two cc's. Two ounces would be nice, right? <laughs> that would be huge. <laughs> be a two hundred thousand dollar therapy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so two cc's of stem cells, and in there was sixty million live um, cells, actually total nucleated cells. Yes. Okay. So and what you're saying is they don't actually become part of our body, but they're then communicating with other cells and have helping like regulate the modulation that's going inside or cells that are kind of not performing as they should. And they're helping bring everything optimal. Is that what's going on? Correct. So when I use the the paracrine signaling, I I knew we'd get back to it eventually. Most people are familiar with the endocrine system in your body, right? If you have problems with diabetes, you go to your endocrinologist or hormone problems. You go to your endocrinologist because your endocrine system controls the entire system of your body, hormones, chemicals, everything that happens. The paracrine system is how cells talk to each other. It's that little distance between cells, right? And that's called paracrine signaling. These cells, when they go into your body, whether it's in a joint or by a damaged tendon or ligament, they see the inflammatory components. What I always say is a damaged cell kind of puts off this little white flag. And that white flag are inflammatory components, tumor necrosis factor alpha and all that stuff we talked about. The cells see that. They dock on a nearby micro blood vessel and they begin to give nutritional support to those damaged cells. As that happens, that's when you start to feel it. Now in a joint or in soft tissue, many times that can take several weeks because there are major inflammatory components at that site 
and they need to be inhibited over that time. But paracrine signaling is the key. The cells are talking to each other. Got it. So when you inject these umbilical cords to cells, how are they better than, say, your own cells in the certain in that area of that infl- inflammation? How are they better at helping you to heal that inflammation versus just your own cells helping to heal the surrounding cells, you know? Right. Great question. And the reason being that if you're 20, 30, 40 years old, pretty healthy, no autoimmune disorder in place, you should use your own cells. But number one, a lot of 20, 30, 40 year olds don't want to have a bone marrow aspirate procedure, or they don't want to have, say, a liposuction procedure to have those cells. The, where umbilical cord blood stem cells come in is this cord is a maximum of nine months old. These cells are young, they're immature, they're very vital. The difference being at 59 years old, I've lived a long life and I enjoy life and we live in a city and we have a lot of environmental things. By age 50, the, the quantity and the quality of the cells in my body are so variable that even the autologous, our, our own studies that are taken throughout the world, They exclude anybody who's 50 years old or older because they know the variation of the quantity of the cells in your body is huge, but the variation of the quality, if you happen to have an autoimmune disorder or anything else that's going on, the actual content of the cells in your body is so diminished. So sometimes, you know what? Your own cells are the best. But a lot of people, and we treat a lot of professional athletes, they're like, I don't want to be down. I don't want the downtime. I don't want the potential for, you know, the back pain after the surgery. Or, you know, if you're super fit and you don't have any fat, you, you don't have any lipo. You know, you don't have any adipose tissue in order to take out. So it, it's kind of variables. Uh, last week in at the gym, a woman knew, came up and said, I've got this going on, la, 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 la. My orthopedic surgeon said, this would be the best thing to use my own cells. What do you think? I go, like, you're 24 years old. We discussed her health history, had no health history. Yes, he's absolutely correct. And that's exactly what I would do for optimal reserves in our own body. But if you're over 50, you said the quantity goes down, but are are the quality of the stem cells also a concern after 50? Very much so, because that cell is still 50 plus years old, right? Yeah. As a child, as a baby that's born, one out of every 10,000 of your cells in bone marrow is a stem cell. By the time you reach skeletal maturity, it's down to one out of every 100,000. So the lay person would say, oh my God, how could that be? The medical professions understand that when you're a child growing up, your bone marrow is in all of your long bones, right? By the time you reach skeletal maturity, it's only in your nominates, your pelvis, your sternum, sternum, maybe maybe your, your tibial plateau. So you're down to 10% of your stem cells by age, what, 16, 17, 18? By age 50, it goes to one out of every 400,000 stem cells. And by age 70 to 80, it's about one out of every 2 million cells. So it, it, it variably drops off. There have been a lot of studies where they, they've studied a lot of older people. And every once in a while, you'll see that 90-year-old guy that's still running the marathon. Well, he happened to be born really rich yeah. with stem cells. <laughs> you know, right. And there are people in the world that get really sick early in age. And they're probably that subclass of people that weren't that lucky and didn't have much. Most of us fall kind of in the middle class. As we age, it normally goes down, and by age 50, it becomes highly variable. So that's why they say in in autologous studies, 50 is pretty much the cutoff. And are are there any genetic factors that determine who has more stem cells versus who doesn't? And second part of that is, are there any things that you could do naturally to kind of boost stem cells organically, or is it just, you know, what you're born with is going to be your predisposition for life? That most of that, the, if we talked about, would be anecdotal. There have been some studies on how to lengthen the telomer, which is a big study right now. But most of it's anecdotal, and it's really not delved that much in science, so we don't have that greatest studies on it. So a lot of it is kind of what you have. Obviously, a cleaner lifestyle is going to be better, mm. but pretty much what you have is what you get. So 
you said you mentioned the stem cells have this paracrine effect, modulating the immune system, binding damaged cells, helping to heal inflammation. But another big thing that stem cells could potentially do is differentiate into different types of other cells, like a pluripotent stem cell. Um, when do you think science will get to the point where we are actually differentiating cells and using them for like regenerative tissue? So let's be really clear. In an allogeneic source, you know, number one, the mesenchymal stem cells create the anti-inflammatory immunomodulatory effect. The second component is to give nutritional trophic support to damaged cells to make them healthy, and then to stimulate healthy cells to undergo mitosis, like when they're young and start to duplicate themselves. The third part of that component is stimulating our own endogenous stem cells, not only at the site to become activated, but also to become stimulated and activated from bone marrow and to migrate to the site. So that's what we see from a multipotent cell, right? When you talk about a pluripotent cell, that's a cell at the embryonic level that has the, ab the ability to differentiate into different cells. They're actually doing studies right now in Australia and they're using what's called parthenogenetic utilization of stem cells, parthenogenetic stem cells. So parthenon, literally the Greek, Greek trans, uh, translation is virgin. So they take a simple um, oocyte, an egg. So we're not dealing with ethics anymore, right? It's, it's not a uh, it, it's, it, it's not an embryo. It's not an inseminated cell. It's just the oocyte. They stimulate it, and on its own, it becomes um, a moila and becomes a fibroblast, and they're able to take those cells out of there. Now, at that point, with that induced pluripotent stem cell, they are now actually creating and differentiating into specific type of cells, and that's the study that's going on in Melbourne, Australia right now for Parkinson's disease. And they're, stim they're injecting it directly into the striatum and the substantia nigra in the brain. And they're seeing tremendous results. So around the world, it's happening all the time. It's going to take some time to get it into the U.S. And why is that? What's, so what's the reason? I mean, obviously, we know it's a, the controversy surrounding it. But from your perspective, someone who's in the business firsthand, What's what's the reason that it's such a holdup in the U.S. to be able to start doing this? We know what the benefits are. Most of his perception back in the 1980s, middle 1980s, George H.W. Bush. Remember, he said there'll be no human testing of uh, stem cells. Well, everybody assumed it's a right to life issue. Certainly a part of the issue it was. But the reality is what the scientific world knew that from conception to week 15, that's when DNA is created and passed amongst the cells. After week 15, after conception, DNA does not pass or create anymore. So the umbilical cord stem cells that we use are a minimum of 36 weeks old because they're a planned cesarean section. So there's no longer DNA passage. So the big holdup in the United States, a lot of ethical components. That's why this parthenogenetic potential is going to be very big in the very near future. That was only discovered in 2011, if you can imagine that. So it's moving very rapidly in that direction to make a pluripotent cell. Most of it is misconception of where the cells come from. Right. But, um, it, I mean, and it's real. It, it, using an embryonic stem cell is very real. You have to uh, stop that the progression of that life. Got it. So, and I mean, can we just dive into that a little more? So you, I mean, so you're, it's in essence kind of an abortion that's happening and you're using that embryonic stem cell to create the stem cells, to, to use it, to harvest it or what, like what's actually happening through the process? Right. It's not allowed in the United States, right. but in, in other parts of the world, they will use an embryo that has a sperm and an egg mm -hmm. and it's been fertilized. And they take it to the point that, you know, the first stage is they undergo meiosis and then they become a moila, which is just a ball of cells. And mm -hmm. from there, they progress to what's called a fibroblast. Inside that fibroblast is the intercellular mass. That intercellular mass contains the stem cells that have the potential to become anything in the body. It doesn't matter. Eyes, lung, liver, and all that sort of thing. The problem is 
that cell left in a friendly environment would become a human being. So in the United States, that's where we've shut it off and said no. So that's why this idea of possibly parthenogenetic manifestation of stem cells is coming along. Until that happens, we have the ability at least to, with umbilical cord blood stem cells, stimulate cells to mimic that in a multipotent way, not a pluripotent way. These cells don't go inside a joint and go, there's cartilage missing, we should replace that. That's not what they do, right? They, they signal those unhealthy cells to become healthy, stimulate them to undergo mitosis and to duplicate themselves. But where the regeneration of new tissue happens from that injection is when our own stem cells, our endogenous stem cells are stimulated. Those cells can go, that's damaged tissue. I should replace that. And that's an excellent explanation. And, and for the first time, I feel like I really understand what a multipotent stem cells, multiple potencies are. You've broken them down really well. And I think it's key to also understand that in the United States, the stem cells that we're using do not cause an abortion of a fetus. These are these are cells that are taken after the baby has been born right. at a minimum of 36 weeks by a plan C-section. So everything is, you know, legitimate, right? right. And um, that brings up the actual mechanics of how does how do companies acquire those stem cells? Are they donated? Are they sold to companies? How does how do you get the hand how you get your hands on these stem cells to actually then process them and provide them to the public? So typically in a pre-planned cesarean section, four weeks before mama's gonna give birth for a pre-planned cesarean section, she sees her OBGYN. They're first asked, would you like to keep the cord for your own baby? Less than 10% do. It's probably a cost factor because it can be a little expensive. Uh, the physicians in the hospitals we work with, if mama says, no, we can't afford to keep it, then they ask if they would like to donate it. A lot of them do because they see the potential. So then they go through an entire battery of uh, medical history, family history, social history, almost anything you can imagine, travel history. And if they pass this 80-some question questionnaire, then mama has to have a blood test in order to make sure that there's not major communicable disease, all the big ones, HIV and, and all that sort of thing. If she passes that, then at the time of delivery, a certified technician takes the cord, takes it into a clean room, and under aseptic technique, removes the venous blood right from the cord. Because the venous blood in the uterus is like it is in the lungs. That's where the, the rich pro, the product is. They then take that, put that into a bag, and deliver it to our lab. Then at the lab, all of the red blood cell components and all the antigenic properties are removed. And then you have that immune-privileged product of heterogeneous mix of cells. At that point, a sample, a, 10, a minimum of 10% of that quantity must be sent to a third-party independent CLIA-certified lab where they do what's called USP 71 testing, United States Pharmacopeia Rule 71, communicable disease and sterility. It's a 14-day sterility test because, you know, your gram positive, that stuff shows up very quickly, but your gram negative doesn't show up very quickly. And we're looking for endotoxins on the gram negative. So once we have all of these certificates in hand and it's clear that mom is good, blood is good, sterility is good, no communicable disease, then we can make that product available for infusion in the body. So really the three major concerns, because if, you, if you're getting another person's umbilical cord blood, mm -hmm. you're basically getting a blood transfusion, right? Correct. And what you want to make sure, number one, that you don't have some sort of um, allerg allergenic response to it. So you're not, that's why you don't have to match the blood match the type, blood. right? Correct. Because all the allergenetics stuff is removed. Right. Secondly, you want to make sure there's no communicable disease like HIV in that blood, which you do with testing of the mother. Correct. And thirdly, you want to make sure the sample itself doesn't have bacteria in it. And that's what you do with the USP testing with the lab. So that's ensuring that it's a sterile specimen that we're receiving, that we're injecting. Correct. Got that's it. right. And also that USP testing of those cells is also for communicable disease. Got it. So you're double checking for communicable disease. It's, it's part of the regulatory. So you talk about how come they can do it around the world, but not in the United States. It's kind of a dual-edged sword. 
The FDA is very tight on this regulatory stuff. Yet when we get approval in the United States, everybody else in the world wants product from the United States. Mm -hmm. They do it first, but when we get approval, they want all this product because then everybody knows. You can go across the border just a couple hundred miles south and get a lot of stuff. Exactly. Right. Exactly. We're we're really going to be setting the standards in the U.S. for stem cells globally. Absolutely. Even this company, we've been in business a little over two years just doing this specific product, and we have distribution all throughout the world because because of that very thing. Other countries probably don't require USP 71 level testing or do they even check for communicable diseases in every country? I mean, I mean, some of them do, but I mean, other countries, you can do xenogenic, xenogenic graphs, hmm. right? They hmm. take it from a duck. Right. They take it from a cow. They take it from sheep. And actually sheep. inject that into humans? Inject it in humans. <laughs> and the reason it works is because when you do an intramuscular injection of that, they don't put it IV because you'd have... Uh, graft versus host disease response immediately, they put it intramuscular and the body recognizes it as foreign. So your immune system immediately is ramped up to this huge high level and they get a response, right? Somebody who has an autoimmune disease, wow, look at this response I had. It It's a limited response and it's a short-term response, but they do get a response. It's funny you mentioned that. Oh. We actually have a friend that did that for MS a long time ago. And uh, they took, I think, a duck gallbladder or liver Correct. or something, and they just put it into her muscle with a little incision. And it did have an effect. Sure. And that's that immune response, not necessarily a stem cell type of, of effect, of not, not a multipotent effect. Exactly. Right. And there was an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, maybe a year ago of a person who'd had a xenogenic graft in Russia, China, and Brazil. Wow. And he was in his doctor's office in New York and was having spine pain did an MRI and he had a mass on his spine and that's where he'd had the the injections done. When they removed it, it was a teratoma. Wow. Why a teratoma? Because these are pluripotent xenogenic cells, a cell from a different species, right? Not a human, a different species. So the body recognized it as foreign and just encapsulated it. And that's what we see when people say, is there any problem with having these cow cells put in my body? Yeah, the potential for a teratoma is fairly high. Yet with umbilical cord blood stem cells, we don't see tumor formation. You definitely don't see a teratoma. Right. Because it's of our body and of the same species. But we don't see tumor formation. Got it. And that's a question that comes up a lot. Like, how do you know this is not going to become cancer in me? And um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Could you go into the science of that a little bit of why these stem cells won't become tumorigenic? So there have been a, there are multiple studies that have gone on around the world and are still going on right now where they're actually treating cancer with umbilical cord blood stem cells. And what they find at the end of the study is it suppresses the tumors and they do not see a proliferation. So they'll say in the, in the finale of the report that because it suppressed it and they did not see a new tumor formation, it's not oncogenic, right? Nor is it tumorgenic. So we have to stand on those studies in order that it doesn't create that. And also, what's important to note is when you define a mesenchymal stem cell, it's actually three components. In order to say there's mesenchymal stem cells in this product, you must have CD90, CD105, and CD73. CDs are cellular differentiators, right? Every cell in our body has about 339 cellular differentiators. Some of them are for natural killer cells. They kill bacteria. And some of them create cartilage and some create bone and and other things. CD105 is specific for hematopoietic stem cells, right? Somebody needs a bone marrow transplant because they had leukemia. You want to see a lot of CD105 in that product. Another is CD73. CD73 is specific for tumor suppression. And they know that it suppresses tumors. CD90 is what we look for in mesenchymal stem cells that we give because it has to do with cellular adhesion, cellular migration, and cellular extravasation across cell borders. How does that work? Like, how do you know that you want to take 103 and inject it into this person because that's what they have? Is Well, one of the federal guidelines in the United States by the FDA is called minimal manipulation. So we cannot more than minimally manipulate a product, and that would be more than minimal manipulation to take it. But we know through, I mean, the first... 
a successful umbilical cord blood stem cell transplant took place in 1988. They found him in cord blood in 78. The first successful transplant was in 88. We know through what, 40 years exactly the, the average component that we see in umbilical cord blood. There's usually a percentage of CD90, CD105, and CD73. We see an average amount of certain growth factors, uh, tumor necrosis factor, alpha, interferon, gamma, VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which causes angiogenesis, and you know, all of these different things. So we know kind of an average that takes place. We cannot manipulate those cells to take one component itself and do it, but many countries around the world do that on a regular basis. Yes. And so let's let's go into that. So we've touched on a little bit. The, the things the FDA doesn't allow in the United States is manipulation, of course. Correct. They don't allow expansion of the cell lines, and they also don't allow banking of your own cells. Could you go into those other two? And then if you any any other ones that you think are significant enough to mention? Well, number one, minimal manipulation. Right. Right. Uh, all we have to do is spin it down and 90% of the red blood cells come off. We do a secondary procedure, which is called glycophorin A columnization. We use laser lights and remove the last components of that, which which makes it um, immunoprivileged. Right. Glycophorin A is also, by the way, known as CD235A. So we have it in our body, right? If you want a uh, an acquired immunity when you have a vaccination, CD235 picks up your HLA-DR and sets up your body for acquired immunity. So we know that CD235 or 235A is directly correlated with HLA-DR. So we use it to pull HLA-DR out of the product. So minimal manipulation is number one. Expansion of cells, it's not allowed yet here. Right. But with new investigational new drug studies that are coming along, maybe sometime in the future it will be allowed because it's going to be necessary at some point in time to expand cells. Even if you say the... The one approved treatment right now for umbilical cord blood stem cells is for bloodborne dyscrasia in a child. And the reason they limit it to a child is because you can only get so many cells out of a single umbilical cord, right? If you're lucky, you'll get a billion cells. It could take a billion cells to treat that bloodborne dyscrasia. When they open it up and allow those expansion of those cells, you can have a trillion cells in a week. Right? And with expansion, how does that work? How do you take a cell and expand it? You just put it in a culture medium and put it into an incubator. And about every 24 hours, they duplicate themselves. And they'll do that for 80 or 90 generations. So wow. when you take 80 or 90 times a billion, 1 billion, 2 billion, 4 billion, 8 billion, 16 billion, it rapidly multiplies. Yeah. So are you saying an adult in the United States that has a bloodborne dyscrasia wouldn't be able to get enough stem cells to treat that dyscrasia? Well, now, now we're going back to uh, paragraph 361 of the federal regulations that say, in the United States as a manufacturer or distributor, we're not allowed to market nor advocate anything with the systemic use. However, if, if we're talking about why they allow it for children, you, it would require so many cells that at this point in time, it's just not available because we don't have the availability of expansion of cells in the United States. But once they are available to be expanded, it opens up a whole new kind of treatment for bloodborne dyscrasias. For whole new world. A whole new world for a lot of different diseases. We do it in Mexico. We, uh, we license with a clinic in, in Cancun, and they, have, they expand cells, and they can make a, a billion, two billion, three billion cells in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And you can treat those sorts of dyscrasias. Could you touch on banking a little bit? What's the problem the FDA has with banking your cells? Banking your own cells? Yeah. The regulations say that if you pull those cells out of your body, whether it's BMAC, bone marrow aspirate, or adipocytes, that it has to be back in your body within a certain period of time. I mean, the regulations even go to the point that if, if you have a suite with a surgical suite next door, doesn't work. It has to be in the same vicinity, in the same locale. I'm not sure of the reasoning why that is, but other than most of these regulations you see can be 10, 15, 20 years old, and it just hasn't been updated yet. I, I think the, uh, Dr. Gottlieb, the director of the FDA, said or at one point in time, he said, we are 
and the FDA themselves are like, um, they're trying to live in a digital society, but they don't come from a digital world, right? And they just haven't caught up to those aspects yet, but they will eventually. We see that a lot with government is just not keeping up scientific discovery, not just in um, healthcare, but also like with artificial intelligence. No one knows how to regulate or control that, and it's catching up. And so I think the FDA is going to have to learn to live with the new times of how quickly discovery is happening and still ensure safety as discovery progresses, especially when you start applying artificial intelligence to the amount of medical knowledge that's out there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of the dual edged sword. It's Mm -hmm. kind of our bane. Geez, why are they holding us back yet around the world? That's the gold standard for safety. Yeah. Right. So it's a little of each. And when you see the the travesties that happen around the world, (laughs) then you say, okay, I'm, I'm glad we have this here. Exactly. Right. How far on the horizon do you think it is before it's really going to get opened up in the U.S.? Uh, Because of the clinical trials that are taking place and some of the investigational new drug trials that we're getting involved with, I would say three to five years, probably maybe up to seven years. Uh, Musculoskeletal is Mm -hmm. going to happen much faster than systemic. But systemic is definitely on the horizon. And because there are accredited studies that have happened around the world, we don't have to have as high a bar set in the United States because when you have something that's been approved in in Europe and you have that equivalent of the FDA approval there, it's it's much easier to get in the United States. It's happening. It's happening fairly quickly, but it's going to take time. Right. And so basically what we did today, was that almost the limit of what you could do at this point in the U.S. where we have we got blood cord stem cells, we had them injected. That's about as far as you can go in today's. It's beyond what you can do in today's society as far as a manufacturer and distributor is concerned. When we look at the FDA guidelines, they are directed towards us as a manufacturer and distributor. And part of. It's called Title 21, Code of Federal Regulations 1271.1, Paragraph 361. I love it if you've memorized that. (laughs) (laughs) I've said it 12,000 times, right? You know, number one, they have to be minimally manipulated. Number two must be for a homologous effect as advertised and labeled. Homologous doing the same thing in the cord as it does in the body. Uh, Number three, you can't add anything other than crystallized water, a sterilizing solution, and or cryopreservant. But number four, you cannot use it for anything that would have a systemic effect. And if it does have a systemic effect, then it either must be autologous or a first or second degree relative. So that's as a manufacturer. What's important to note is the FDA and government regulations govern us as manufacturers and distributors, not physician groups what they do. That primarily falls under your state regulatory bar board, which is essentially do no harm. So technically what you did, the reason I'm not there for that is because as a company, we can't advocate it and we can't market that sort of thing. Right. And it's up to your physician to Correct. make a diagnosis and uh, perform the procedure if he feels it would be beneficial for you in any Empirical way. Empirical treatment. Empirical treatment, right. Correct. Um, can I ask you on this topic of safety, what should the average person out there who's listening to this right now, they think stem cells might be something that would help them. What should they look for as far as where they go to have stem cells done to ensure that they're getting a good product and they're doing it in a safe environment? Well, I think number one is, you know, trusting your physician and knowing, when, you know, what your physician is going to do and where you're going to go. And secondly, in that your physician has done their due diligence on where they are accessing these cells. What we have done is really move to set the standard in the industry. When you look at labs that produce cells, they're popping up all over the place. You know, people will probably call on you all the time. Hey, we got the best stuff in the product. What what I tell physicians to do is go visit the lab, look at their compliance department, look at their standard operating procedures, look at the uh, certifications for being a CGMP, Certified Good Manufacturing Practice Lab, that sort of thing. Most of the work is on you that you need to understand as a physician, as a group, what type of product you are accessing and what type of product you are acquiring. 
because if, if you're going to be in this space, you need to take the time to do that. As far as a patient is concerned, they should talk to you about that. Have you seen the lab? Have you, have you looked at their compliance? Have you talked to their people? Is there somebody that I can talk to regarding compliance? What's going on with your lab? What's the difference in all these labs? So this is important. This is health and this is your body. So it's important really to dig down and, and understand those important things. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point that the patients and the clients need to take control of their own health and not just outsource all of this to whoever says, you know, you should have some stem cells. They really need to understand. And part of what we're doing here is giving people some of that information, what to look for, what they need to understand about stem cells, and really empower the customer in understanding not just what they're doing and why they're doing it, but how to find the safest way of doing this procedure. And um, I, I really appreciate you coming here and talking about this because well, you're, all the things you're mentioning are key factors in picking the right stem cells. And exactly. Another another big question that comes up a lot of times, the marketplace is so confusing right now. You have umbilical stem cells, placental stem cells, Wharton's jelly. <laughs> how, do you, how does someone make sense of all the different products that come from the placenta or, or around conception right. ver, or around birth? versus um, which one is the best one, you know? It's hard, and I'm in the industry, right. and it's difficult. And, and I know because that's why we're in umbilical cord blood. Most of the difference between umbilical cord blood and umbilical cord has to do with FDA regulations. I mean, if we dig down on that science for a minute, you get uh, stem cells from two different sources in the body, two different diff types of sources. Number one is a structural tissue. You can get it from adipose tissue and you can get it from Wharton's jelly. What the FDA regulations say, and they give an example, if you take adipose tissue out, out of the abdomen or wherever the fat tissue and break it up and inject it into the face, that is considered homologous or approved use of adipose tissue because it is acting as a structural support. Because the definition of a structural tissue is to give a barrier of support for your internal organs, protection, and structural support. And what they say is if you take that same structural tissue, whether it's adipose tissue or it's Wharton's jelly, if you take that and add a, an enzyme to it, collagenase enzyme, to remove the stem cells from that adipose structural tissue and inject that into the body, it is no, no longer a homologous effect because now you're using a structural tissue in a cellular component. So learning about those is like a partial degree in law <laughs> and science at right. the same time. The law firm we use is one of the top FDA law firms in the country, and we had them define it. And I probably spent three hours with a lawyer, PhD in cellular biology. And I'm telling you, it, it exploded my brain. But that's what we had to get into. What is the, the proper things to use? Because we like umbilical cord tissue because there's some potential in that. But legally, we can't use it in the United States at this point in time. We use it in some other clinics around the world. We just can't use it here. So we use what's legal, what we know is legal umbilical cord blood stem cells, and we'll just wait until if, if tissue is ever passed. There are some different issues along with tissue and that there's a lot of debris associated with it. And when you have to break up that tissue in order to get the, uh, and use a collagenase and break it out, a lot of debris. And when you put that debris in the body, you have a higher antigenic response because of debris. So there's a lot of different issues associated with it, but the clear cut is the umbilical cord blood stem cells. Right. So how are people then selling uh, umbilical cord and placenta in the U.S. if the FDA, if it's an FDA issue about structural versus cellular use, it doesn't seem like they should even be selling it here. Is that correct? It, it is correct. And we work directly with the FDA. And, you know, they tell us straight up, we just do not have the manpower to go out and police all these things that are going on right now. 
And so because we work with them directly on a regular basis as a, working as a tissue bank and doing all these things, we confronted them and said, this is what we're doing. We would like to know it's being done in the right way. They're like, what? <laughs> Where are you guys from? You know, but that's what we did up front because we wanted to be the standard bearer in the industry. And they literally said, when we talked to them about cord tissue, they're like, that's, that's completely unacceptable. And it's against the guidelines, but we don't have the manpower to be able to do it. However, over time, they will. They'll get there eventually. I mean, the federal government's like an iceberg. It's not changing direction. It's going to keep moving forward, right. and eventually, it will. It'll do its job. Right. Amazing. I'd I'd love to hear some success stories you guys have had through. I, well, first off, how many patients have have used the the stem cells from you? Do you, do you have an idea? Of from that? Livion, we have done around thirty thousand injections in the U.S. In the U.S. And of those, do you have a couple success stories that you? Well, can share? typically in like a joint. <clears throat> knee joints are the most common. Approximately 86% of the time, the patient only needs one injection and they don't have to have another injection because of the results that they get. Sometimes, and we, we, you know, we don't really know in advance, occasionally that 14% of the time, it could require a secondary injection. So our experience in the United States is primarily musculoskeletal. We've treated Many professional athletes, professional baseball players who have a partial tear to their ulnar collateral ligament, right? And they're up for Tommy John surgery. And we work with surgeons that inject in that area. Six to eight weeks later, they're back pitching. <clears throat> not only consistently, but without pain and have not had to have surgery. So knees are very straightforward. Soft tissue, partial tears of a rotator cuff, partial ACL. Super successful, highly successful. Around the world, when we read research about what's going on around the world with umbilical cord blood stem cells, the most common treatment around the world is for autoimmune disease because it requires about 2 million cells per kilo of body weight, say a million cells per pound to make it easy. And uh, a recent study that was done at Duke University treating cerebral palsy and autism. Now imagine this, two central nervous system problems, Right with intravenous application, and they did the initial study for safety. But when they came out, they also had efficacy, that it was efficient. Now they are going into the next phases of that trial. So hips are a little less successful, probably due to the mechanics of the hip. It's a whole different type of joint system. Shoulders are very successful. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, importance on really being inside the joint, not in the labrum, in the shoulder joints, but typically joints are very successful. In the United States, what we talk about as a company is musculoskeletal treatment, and it's very successful. Got it. And with the joints, does it, do you have to inject right into the joint in order, like will the cells travel throughout the body and still help other areas? regardless of where it was specifically entered the body from? I mean, there have been a lot of studies on that for, say, there was a, a, a seven-year study done in South Korea on, on that particular thing. And then there's, there's some other studies done on just the anti-inflammatory effect of, say, a rheumatoid patient. Now, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, obviously it's a systemic condition that has a localized effect on your body. If you put it systemically... It will help to balance that immune system so your T1, T2 helper cells come into balance, right? Your pro-inflammatory and your anti-inflammatories will come into balance. However, the help inside the joints will be minimal because there's just not that much that's going to make it to the site. If you have osteoarthritis, while we think that osteoarthritis is just inside my knee, it's still a systemic inflammatory response, right? It's not just localized. If you want the best effect, you put it directly inside the joint. And then you will get that effect because joints themselves, the inside capsule of that joint is hydrophobic. Not much gets out. And the example of that is that synovial fluid inside your knee, it takes 30 to 40 days for that fluid to cycle out of your body. The, the, the flow is so very slow. So you want the best results? You put it right there. You want the best results for a partial tear? You put it near the site, subcutaneous, subdermal get it near the site, allow it to be attracted, and do what it's supposed to do. Um, I have another question for you about the science that we get asked about. Um, 
Can you talk a little about the first pass, second pass effect? Sure. And, and we know when they do it intravenously, and there have been a lot of animal studies on this, that the first place that it goes is the lungs. I mean, imagine you're putting it in a vein. What happens when you go in a vein? It goes directly to the right atrium, the right ventricle, and directly into the lungs. Well, the lungs are the external filters to our body. Every time we breathe in air, whether you live on the farm or you live in L.A., you're breathing in that stuff. So the most inflammatory component in your body is probably in your lungs. We know that anywhere from 60 to 80% of those cells will hang up in your lungs immediately because that's where your inflammatory components are, and that's the first site that it sees. They'll stay in there. Different studies say different things. 7, 10, 14 days. Concentrate the secretones from the MSCs and the growth factors, then begin to break off and then go peripheral and do other things. But the first pass effect is very real. They've shown in a lot of animal studies that it does lock up in your lungs immediately. But just because they get locked up doesn't mean that they're going to be ineffective. No, not at all. Because they will be unlocked. Correct. As time goes on. As soon as they, they concentrate themselves, then they will break off and they're because they're a parasite, right? A parasite, not a parasite, uh, a parasite. parasite. They attach to a microvesicle, give it, and when that cell beside them becomes healthy, they move on and, and go to the next thing. So that's the essential pers- first pass effect. And what about longevity? How does that play into it with stem cells? I mean, I assume you're about 100 years old, or are you? 106. <laughs> after yes, 15. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but where, where does longevity come into play when you're doing stem cells? I mean, we're talking a lot about diseases. We're talking about injuries. But what about just doing it for health optimization? Because, you know, really, that's what we're all about at Next Health. We want to give people the ability of really taking charge of their life. And we feel that we're on the, you know, some very, we as humanity are on the cusp of some very meaningful breakthroughs in longevity. Right. So we want people to be able to improve the quality of their life for as long as humanly possible. If we're going to be limited to 120, 150 plus years, are stem cells going to play a part in that? This is a big question. And it's it's a question that's been asked a lot, you know, it's especially around the world. And like I say, as you know, as a company, we don't we can't market or advertise systemic use, but it is the largest use around the world systemically. So the question is, does it make you live longer? And most of the consensus is it may not elongate your life, but the potential is to give you better quality to the life that you have, right? Because you know, we see with uh, around the world, studies around the world, that somebody who is um, going into kidney failure, that they have an intravenous application and their glomerular filtration rate goes up and that they have better kidney function, better liver function, better uh, lung function. There was a seven-year, long-term seven-year follow-up study done in South Korea where they did blood measurements of LDL, HDL, all the percentages, um, and all the, the, the liver function tests. All of them improved significantly. But the interesting thing, the patients who made their reply, what they were most concerned about is their skin looked better and their hair looked better. They didn't care about the blood results. They're right. like, whatever, my LDLs, whatever it is, I look better. All right. They care about the mirror, what they, they care see. About, they care about the mirror. Not yeah. me, of course. <laughs> have you had your telomeres tested by chance? Not my telomeres. I, I have a feeling I'm going to. <laughs> it would have been great if you tested them before you did all the, you know, all your stem cell treatments. Five, six years of them. I, I hope they're long, long, long. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's fantastic. Um, we've run out of time, unfortunately. I think we got a lot of information. Is there anything we missed that we should have talked about? I feel like we talk about a lot. Anything you could think of? No, I think you know you hit the basics of the science, the basics of uh, – I think what's most important is you, there's a very educated public out there. And most of the people that are coming to you are coming because they're educated, they've seen it, and they have questions. So your most difficult job – is managing expectations because there's too much garbage out there on the internet. They feel like they're going to get these cells. They're going to hear harp music and some magical thing is going to happen. You know, this isn't science fiction. It's science. It's biology. It's a process. I tell doctors all the time, we know the pathophysiology of the disease we're looking at. And we know the potential of the cells. I can't look you in the eye and say that if you get these cells, that's what's going to happen because it's science, it's biology. 
So now I think you touch on everything, but your toughest job to the consumer out there, bring in reasonable expectations that this is no different than any other medicine that, that they're going to try to take. Well, I, I think this is blessed from God, absolutely. And Dr. Arnold Kaplan, who is easily the godfather of stem cells in the United States, says, this is like God's medicine cabinet. I believe that, but let's keep it in context. You know, there you have to manage expectations of what this can potentially do. And that, that's very that's very true and very profound. I think there's a lot of people talking very glibly about stem cells and what they can do, and they're doing it for like longevity because they want to live to be 700 years old. <laughs> and um, you know, the reality is, most of the time, you're not going to feel something when you have it injected IV right away. Maybe in your, maybe you will, maybe just the first time like you did. Yes. Um, I've talked to many doctors that specialize in joints and injecting stem cells. They love the product. They think that um, stem cells in the joint is definitely helpful and it can put off joint replacement surgery for many years potentially. Correct. But we really need to do a lot more science um, we need to get through the FDA hurdles, whether they're uh, whether they're legitimate or I mean they're, they're legitimate hurdles, but the FDA is definitely slow. But maybe that's a good thing, like you said. It could be, and it is going to give us the validity in the United States of having Correct. the best possible product, which is where your company is definitely headed. Is getting the best possible product out there, setting those standards. So we truly appreciate you coming to talk to us here. My pleasure. And Next Health has been very educational, and uh, we look forward to getting some stem cells with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.